right, all right, all right. How's everyone doing? It's 7.40, we should start. I'm getting really antsy as a teacher. <laughs> I need to start on time. Sit down, sit down. Be seated. I got to start on time, otherwise I'm not doing my job as a teacher. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Awesome. Oh my God, thank you so much for being here. I know it's a cold day. I don't know if everyone is going to show up, even you bought the tickets. And can you give yourself a, a round of applause just for being here? Um, I know how difficult it is to do to, to produce a show in in December, the holidays, and um, and particularly it's a cold day. So I really appreciate that you are here. So my name is Ada Jen, and this is Randy King, um, and this is a. Uh, we're the co-producer and co-host for Talk Stories, an Asian American, Asian diaspora storytelling show. Uh, so we started the show, uh, Archie, Jen, Jim, and I, we started the show in January 2018, and then Randy Kim came on board in 2019. Um, so we took the show to, take the show to uh, museums and community centers uh, because we want to show people uh, what different community organizations are doing. And this is not just for entertainment. What we really want to do is to educate, learn about our history. And in Talk Stories, uh, it's about uh, showcasing artists uh, of, uh, of Asian descent, Asian Americans, and in storytelling in different forms. For example, uh, personal narrative, uh, music, dance, uh, or improv. Um, and so we want, to we want to showcase talent, but also for us to have our own space to talk about um, issues relevant to Asian American, Asian uh, diaspora experiences. Um, and what's also important for talk story is that we usually integrate community members, uh, people who may not have performance experiences to tell stories because it is our belief that everyone has a story to tell and everyone should have the opportunity to share stories. Um, and so uh, this is what Talk Story is about. And so thank you so much for being here. And let me ask you, we're here at the Japanese American Service Community. For how many people this is your first time in the space? Raise your hand. Oh my goodness. So thank you so much for being here. And make sure before you leave, uh, kind of a, take a look at a, uh, kind of travel a little bit, you know, see what, what the space is about, what this community center is doing um, and what services they're providing. And this is, uh, I have brought uh, quite a few shows here, but exactly a year ago, we brought talk stories here to the space. And I would like to have the executive, chief executive director, Mike Takada, uh, to speak a few words about the community organization. Thank you, Ada, and welcome everybody to the Japanese American uh, Service Committee. And uh, you know, this is a real testament to the the beautiful thing that Ada and then Randy have created. Because as Ada had mentioned, you know, here we are days before the holiday. It's freezing cold outside, but we all want to be here to hear these wonderful stories, right? So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ada and, and Randy, for, for doing talk stories. Uh, as Ada had mentioned, uh, the service committee uh, is a, a, a social service agency and community center. We were founded in 1946 uh, after World War II as a result of the mass migration of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II off of the West Coast. And so when the war, as the war wound down and ended, uh, a number of those individuals and families um, either elected not to or couldn't go back to their homes of origin on the West Coast and started to gradually migrate eastward. And Chicago being the hub, the transportation hub that it always has been, was a natural pass-through uh, place. And fortunately for our community, the Japanese American community, there were individuals who saw a need to create an organization that would help people find new housing, 
find jobs, and rebuild communities. And so that is how this organization came to be in 46. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be, you know, fast forward now till now, uh, the leader of this organization that is still committed to um, serving the community. And we have really expanded our definition of the community to be anyone in need of, of social services, uh, primarily to our elders. Uh, we have been taking care of seniors for many years now, providing social services, uh, adult day services, home support services, and it's, it's for, again, anyone in need. Uh, the other uh, uh, area of focus for the organization has been to uphold and celebrate the heritage and the legacy of our, our ancestors who, you know, went through the war experience, whether it's here in the States or those that, you know, experienced the war in Japan, found themselves coming to America after the war, trying to get settled in a, in a new land. Uh, and so we, we have lots of programs that are focusing on celebrating the Japanese culture, uh, Japanese music, the Japanese language, et cetera. So if anybody has any interest in any of those things, we welcome all people into, into our space. Uh, the last area of, of, fo of focus for the organization is capturing and um, archiving collections of, of materials, photographs, and in fact stories. We have a very growing uh, video archive where we are um, capturing first person narratives of individuals uh, just to tell their stories of what it was to either you know live that experience of, of being incarcerated or being a uh, being part of a family who has that incarceration experience in their history or being a new immigrant you know coming to America trying to get established and, and set up a new life create family, uh, create community. So we are actively uh, working to uh, videotape a lot of those, those stories. And um, a lot of this information is available if you go to our website, uh, jasc-chicago.org. Uh, we have lots of information. A lot of this materials uh, and reference materials are available. So I invite you all to, you know, check that out. Um, I, I'm just thrilled to see uh, a lot of old friends, but a lot of new friends here in, in our space. Um, I'm going to be here through the evening. Uh, I'd be more than happy to talk to you more about our programming. We do have a couple of clipboards passing around the room. Um, the, the, the challenge for tonight with the Eventbrite was that we were only able to capture one individual who was actually doing the sign up. So if you came with uh, other people, if there were multiple people on that reservation, we don't have your contact information. So that's the reason why we have the, the clipboard going around. So uh, I don't want to you know, put the, the, the fun part of this evening, the interesting part of the evening off any longer. So I will turn it right back to Ada. So welcome again. I am Ada Chang. <laughs> Little change there. Um, so, actually, my name is Randy Kim, and thank you so much for being here. I'm a little nervous right now because I'm so excited to see all of you. So, without taking much time away, I would like to introduce to you our first guest and performer. So, I met Alec Fan several years ago through, I'm going to have a nervous attack saying this, through i 2 i which stands for Invisible to Invincible. Asian Pacific Islander LGBTQQIA <laughs> organization. So we made it a potluck, and if you haven't heard by to i it's, as I mentioned, I'm not gonna repeat that long <laughs> word. So if you haven't heard about them, we have some i 2 i members, former and current, they're still here in this audience. This has been a great uh, organization for our LGBTQ API community, so um, I'm very thankful to meet Alec through the potluck, and also I was watching Alec's Instagram, watching him perform songs that are very acoustic, it's very beautiful, and I said, Ada, give him a chance, it's beautiful. <laughs> so 
quick uh, introduction, Alec has uh, been a trans Vietnamese artist, uh, currently working in theater now and working on his music. So without further ado, give it up for Alec Fan. Tell me if my fly is open. These pants are not great. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to forego the microphone because I think it'll sound better. Um, yeah, I'm Alec. Say that one more time. Alec. 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 Is that all right? Say Amy and Mike your guitar. Oh, oh, that's okay. I think I think uh, this is better. Yeah. Um, my name is Alec. Uh, I have been making music for most of my life, um, but uh, I think I'm just now starting to. Uh, figure out what kind of musician I want to be for my communities, in relation to my communities. Um, so that said, I am going to play for you two cover songs today, uh, uh, songs from genres that uh, define me not just as a musician, but as a person. Um, so I bet you've never heard this one before, but I have always been drawn to really old things. Um, that translates to my music as well. And my uh, primary tools of investigation of old things have been music and language. Um, and being that, for better or for worse, which is a whole other can of worms, a whole other pop stories theme, um, my first language and most fluent language is English. Um, I have come to learn and love a lot of uh, medieval and Renaissance music from Britain and Western Europe. So the first song I'm going to sing for you is a medieval ballad. Um, it was written by an anonymous uh, musician sometime in the early 14th century uh, in Middle English. So. Somewhere between Beowulf and Shakespeare, I'm not sure. Where <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's like your classic courtly love song. It's got it's full of unrequited feelings and uh, hope, and it is my hope that even if you don't understand words coming out of my mouth, um, the music will touch your hearts. Um, the song is called uh, "Bird on a Branch." <laughs> the whole show, we're going to have to do this because I'm pretty small. <laughs> I'm probably the smallest one uh, here, and you can see Randy is t one of the tallest Asians. Um, so, <laughs> so, how's everyone doing? Are you ready for our first storyteller? Yeah! 
Cameron Kuhn, um, I met her uh, 2017. That was the first time that I brought uh, my own solo show to the museum. Uh, she's now the board of director with the National Cambodian Heritage Museum. And in 2017, she was actually the first Cambodian woman to ever uh, elected to a public office. Um, let me ask you, is this your first time telling story? I know you have public speaking experience, but this is your first time telling story? Okay, so this is your first time in Camry telling story. Do you know what you need to do? Be nice. Be nice. That's right. <laughs> Be nice. Can we welcome Camry Kung? People do not change Cambodia. Cambodia changes you. I came to America as an infant child and returned to my homeland of Cambodia for the first time at 18 years as an adult. On that life-altering trip, I discovered what it meant to be home, my privilege as an American, and my resolution to break free from the ghosts of the past. On home, Locals saw me as Ne Amrik, an American. They were able to judge immediately that I did not grow up in Cambodia based on my skin tone. It was obvious, they told me. I had been spared from a lifetime of hot tropical sun weathering on my skin. It didn't matter to me. For the first time in my life, I felt at home. I was in a land where people spoke my language they looked like me, and I was bound together by a shared history. I remember riding through the luscious green countryside in the land I never grew up in. But in that moment, recognizing this is my home. These are my people. I was overwhelmed with emotion as my heart cried for the millions of lives lost the suffering of our people, of my people. On privilege, I had many playful but candid conversations with Amek, my loquacious nine-year-old cousin, whose father was hosting us and served as our guide while in Cambodia. We spoke of fortune and hope as we imagined what life would be like if he could come and experience America for himself. But alas, it was not in the stars, he would say. Through the eyes of this young boy who saw so much and yet knew so little of the world outside of him, I became present to my own privilege of being one of the lucky ones to not only escape war and genocide, but to also live as an American. As we visit friends and family, they share with us their personal journeys of how they survived, why they stayed, and what life was like after the war. It made me aware of the people we left behind. It was lottery, by pure chance, that I made it to America and they didn't. I was one of the lucky ones because I survived and I was able to leave a country torn by war. I was returning home as Ne Amrik, an American. This is my privilege. On the ghosts of my past, in our final week there, Cambodia's dark history and my own haunting ghosts collided. While my mother, while waiting for my mother at the city flea market, I saw a little girl carrying an infant boy in her arms, begging for money. In the hot, sweltering sun, he lied so still and limp in her arms, but in that moment, in the land where I was overwhelmed by poverty and moments of darkness, an absurd thought occurred to me. I wondered if he was alive. 
I found myself in a trance following the little girl around the market until I finally saw movement from him. As I returned to my family, my father appeared and something in him snapped. I cringed. I didn't know what hit me. Looking back today, I wonder if he had his moment of darkness take over him just as I did when I followed the little girl around the market. A flurry of curses came flailing at me as he yelled and bystanders watched in confusion. I stormed out into the streets and into the crowd, witnessing the dramatic scene unfold. I wanted to run away into the darkness and never return. I thought about never setting foot back on that plane ride home and staying in Cambodia to die. My mother caught up to me and put me in a ciclo. I locked myself up in the bedroom and cried my final remaining days in Cambodia. Never had I cried so much as I sat there and confronted what living meant. I shut myself from the world and wanted to disappear. I don't know what triggered my father to verbally assault me the way he did that day and in such a public way. I think about how this was also his first return trip to the motherland. We visited childhood places where my parents grew up in. We reunited with long departed relatives and prepared our goodbyes not knowing when we would be able to see them again. Maybe it was the living, or perhaps it was the dead that triggered his reaction. He had an older beloved sister whose name I bear, who died many years before. My grandfather was a five-star general in Lenol's army. He would probably tell us, as a young boy, when his father learned that he was afraid of the dark, he took him to a cemetery in the middle of the night to get over his fear. This was a person who raised him on how to be a man and how to control his emotions. What the onlookers and the world didn't know was the heavy weight that I carried on my shoulders that afternoon. I was sexually abused by my father when I was eight years old. Though the abuse eventually stopped, I lived under the same roof with that man from childhood to adulthood. The innocence was stripped away from my childhood and what I had was pain and disgust hiding in the darkness. As a child of refugees, I took on the role of navigator, helping my mother across cultural and language barriers to access social services, immigration and naturalization, and even my own educational journey. I saw my mother as a victim to a physically abusive husband. I couldn't abandon her. I struggle to this day with the choice my mother made in being more fearful of being alone and the shame of what my father did than understanding the years of trauma and nightmares I would be put through in the time since. I chose to stay as a sacrifice to my family. It was what was necessary to keep the family together. But in that moment, in that small bedroom in Cambodia, as our worlds collided, I realized my father and I could no longer exist in the same space. One of us was going to die, and I didn't want it to be me. I chose living. This meant I could no longer be the sacrifice. I had to break free from my parents' trauma. It would take me years to process what happened, but I came to recognize myself as the only agent in breaking out of the cycle of violence in my family. No one was going to save me. I had to save myself. 
And as I looked into the future, it wasn't just about me. I imagine a future with a family of my own someday. What would life be like for my unborn children? My actions would determine whether or not the trauma would pass on to them. It was time to break free. This was the beginning of my journey. Like I said in the beginning, people don't change Cambodia. Cambodia changes you. Thank you so much, Cam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, being a son of refugees, uh, my parents being from Southeast Asia, this is a narrative that is very too familiar to me and I'm trying to process your story and thank you so much for sharing and for sharing in this beautiful space. So please give another round of a well applause for Cam. Okay, so. I would like to introduce to you our next performer. So Chris Odana has been known in the poetry community here in Chicago. Um, giving a quick synopsis, poetry is her foundation. It's a way to reclaim our narratives and to tell our, our art and culture through our own agency. And uh, so she hosts Luya Poetry. So if you're interested in doing Poetry Open Mic, please reach out to her because it's ongoing. It's meant for the Asian diaspora, for all of our communities. So let's welcome Chris Aldana. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm used to telling uh, or stories through poetry. Uh, so this is very new for me. This is my first time actually telling just like a straight up story. So be nice. Um, <laughs> this is called How to Make Adobo, parentheses, What's a Filipino? <clears throat> we begin with a whole chicken, expertly cut into pieces that can fit into a cast iron wok. Next, minced garlic. How much? Enough that the smell will linger on your fingertips despite much meticulous scrubbing. Enough that it will still be there tomorrow, faintly reminding you of the feast you had the night before. From here, we balance the salt, sour, sweet, and spice. Our walk becomes a vessel for alchemy. Vinegar, soy sauce, bay leaves, peppercorns, turmeric, coconut milk, swirling into a silken sauce that permeates the chicken and lovingly coats each grain of rice on our plate. My family's adobo is both sadilao, meaning yellow, and sagata, meaning milk. And it is unlike the adobo that I have had in anyone else's home, including the homes of my own immediate family. Like our adobo, my family is unlike other Filipino families that I've met. We are multiracial. My siblings and I are the result of a Filipina mother and a white father. In my case, a Brazilian man who was not the man who raised me, and in my siblings' case, an Australian man who was my parent in every way except through blood. Between the five of us, we have lived on three continents, in five countries, in seven cities, and we have never lived as a family unit in the country of anyone's birth. So here we are, a mixed race, blended, multicultural household with no standard concept of home or cultural and ethnic identity. My siblings and I may share similar foundations, but our construction of our Filipinoness is intrinsically different. My family's adobo is built on the foundations of the dish that existed long before Spanish colonizers or Chinese merchants ever reached our shores. Chicken, or sometimes pork, vinegar, and garlic. From here, my mother takes the dish into her own hands, creating from the adobo that she grew up with and pulling from regional variations that appeal to her taste buds. It's a recipe that she is deeply, deeply protective of. Um, she recently asked me not to share it with others, and this story might be sharing too much already, but um, you know, she's also very ready to share this recipe with people that she loves. 
I've never probed very deeply into why she's chosen to cook her adobo this way and only this way for us. It's the only way that I make adobo. And while I will sing its praises until my voice is hoarse, I won't ever tell you that it's the only way to make it. Um, and I think that most Filipinos across the world would agree that there is no right way to make adobo. And I wish that this acceptance of difference or even celebration, I'd say, extended to identity. Uh, raise your hand if you have ever felt like you're not Asian enough. Keep your hand raised if you have felt that way because someone else either directly or indirectly questioned your identity. Cool, hands down, thank you. At my British school in Vietnam, we had an annual International, flag day, uh, International day Flag procession. A chance, supposedly, for our school community to celebrate our diversity in all the countries that we come from. A conundrum that my siblings and I faced every year. What line are we supposed to freaking stand in? I didn't particularly want to stand in the American line. I always felt that my Americanness was a fortunate accident of birth, a necessity for my single mother trying to navigate her pregnancy alone in Los Angeles. I felt quite viscerally that I would not stand in the Brazilian line, given that I knew nothing about my birth father and even less about what it meant to be an Italian Lebanese immigrant to Brazil. I felt odd about standing in the Australian line, since I had never lived in Australia, I had no papers to prove my ties to the country, and Claiming it solely through association to my dad kind of felt like cheating. So by process of elimination, I usually decided to stand in the Filipino line. One year after much pondering, I took my spot in line with the other Filipino kids to wait for the parade to start. I made sure to be close to the middle because I didn't feel Filipino enough to stand at the front with the flag and I definitely didn't want to look like I was trailing behind in the back. So I found myself in line behind a boy that I knew in a year below me. We weren't close friends, but he was always nice and we had seen each other grow up through the years. So I was excited to have a familiar person to wait with while I was feeling so anxious. My excitement did not last long. Chris, I didn't know you were Filipino. He seemed amused. He paused. All of my insecurities flared up in those milliseconds. My body, too big for Asian beauty standards, including Filipino ones. My language, a halting Tagalog that was peppered with so much English, I may as well have just been putting on an accent. All the words in Bisaya that I had forgotten, all the places and roads and landmarks I couldn't name in Cebu, all the questions that I had about my history that I was too ashamed to have to ask. And then he said, I never see you at church. Ah. Catholicism, the official religion of my people, supposedly. This was probably not a good time to inform him that my parents were not raising us to be religious. And just like that, I had another requirement to add to the growing list of things I needed to be in order to be Filipino. It's not surprising that when I went to college in Columbus, Ohio, where white people are made, I was unsure <laughs> about joining our school's Filipino student group. I was convinced that they would be so much more Filipino than me. They'd all be fluent Tagalog speakers with deep knowledge of our traditions and our history. When I finally worked up the courage to go to a meeting my second year of school, I was deeply homesick, a little depressed, and desperately in need of my mother's adobo. I knew that they wouldn't have my mom's version, of course, but I figured that at least they would know where to find it in our white college town. It turns out that I was wrong about everything except the adobo. These kids were like me, trying to understand where they came from, realizing that being Filipino meant more to them than they thought, but unsure of how to proceed. Some of them had never been to the Philippines, had never met their extended family. Some of them had stories about being the only Filipino in their school or in their town. All of us, in one way or another, felt both connected and disconnected to our culture. It would be cute to say that once I joined the Filipino Student Association that all my troubles were resolved. Like I had finally been approved to join the ranks. Not quite. Our student org was a safe place to negotiate our identity. But once we stepped out of that space, we had to contend with everyone else's expectations. One year, myself and the rest of the executive board were at Costco, buying the ingredients necessary to make adobo for a fundraiser that we were hosting. As you might have guessed, the only way to reliably get adobo was to make it your damn self. 
As we winded our way through the towering aisles of Costco, cart full of chicken legs, trying not to get distracted by the tasting counters on our way to checkout, we saw her, a Filipina woman about the same age as most of our mothers, handing out samples. Almost telepathically, we agreed to approach her counter. As we munched on our samples, deciding whether we would bring it up first or if she would, one of us asked, are you Filipino? Her eyes lit up. She smiled in that familiar way almost all Filipinos smile when we find one another in places we don't expect. Yes, she said. For a moment, we were overjoyed. And then she said, do you speak Tagalog? Almost instantly, we deflated. I mumbled that we didn't. Then she said, I, then you're not really Filipino. I was enraged. How dare she? Of course, being good Filipinos who respect our elders, we didn't want to make a scene in public. So I did what was in character for me. I wrote a poem instead. Uh, I'm not going to read that poem today, but I will share that something in me changed during that process. I wrote it because I was angry, yes, but I realized that I was no longer measuring my Filipinoness based on a process of elimination. In that poem, I talked about all of the things that I know and love about the Philippines, about my family's history, and I ended with the assertion that being Filipino is more than food or language or cultural pride. It's not something that you can hold in your hands. It is something that you feel. And even if I don't have the words to explain that feeling, it is no less real or important. These days, I can make my mother's adobo from memory. I don't apologize for its difference. I add in the turmeric and the coconut milk and explain to both my Filipino and non-Filipino friends that there are as many ways to be Filipino as there are ways to make adobo. That the way my mother makes it is not the same way your mother makes it, and the way your mother makes it may not even be the same way that you make it. Every generation brings a new twist to recipes that have transformed over centuries, an abundance of adobos that are all just as valid as the next. Thank you so much, Chris. This is what this show is about. F have all of us ask this question, where is home? What does homeland mean? What does being homeless feel like? When we are everywhere, but yet we're nowhere. What does being Asian mean? What constitutes Asian identity? What defines us? And who gets to define? Who has a say? And this is the first part of the storytelling. For us to really think about these issues and for all of us, it doesn't just apply to Asian American, it can apply to people of all racial and cultural identities. Let's welcome Alec Fan. I swear y'all, this was not planned at all, but I'm gonna sing a song about coming home. Uh, wow. This song uh, comes out of Appalachia, which is a region that uh, I deeply appreciate. Uh, it is it's not about coming home, about yearning for home, about missing home, uh, which is, as we've heard, a theme that is that resonates not only with uh, folks in diaspora, but with trans folks as well. Um, so it's a, a song that means a lot to me. Uh, it's called Blue Ridge Mountain Blues. Uh, I'm going to do it in the style of Doc Watson. I can't get my country ring on. <laughs> <laughs> when I was young and in my prime, I left my home in Caroline. Now all I do is sit and cry. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alec. Thank you so much. Give another round of applause for Alec. So I am very excited about our next guest, next teller, uh, V, or otherwise Vivica Ray Mazumder. I have known V several years back through their work with Asians American Advancing Justice. Um, they have been working on youth uh, development leadership uh, through Kinetic. And uh, V just recently left Advancing Justice, uh, finishing out their masters. And so this is gonna be, V, this is your first time as well? Awesome, so please give a round of applause for V. Hello, okay. Yeah, so as a youth worker of almost a decade, I'm really used to being on the other side of the mic, so this is a new experience for me, so thank you. One thing I can see, I look at the clock, it's 8.22. I'm overcome with the feeling of dread because even numbers are bad. This must mean something terrible is going to happen because I looked at the clock at 8.22. One thing I can touch, Someone has brushed by me and touched me on my left side. Now I feel uneven, unbalanced, and I can't stop thinking about it. This is somewhat akin to the feeling of sitting on a chair and having half my body hanging off. I'm going to nonchalantly touch myself on my right side so that I can stop being so preoccupied with this experience of feeling uneven. One thing I can hear, my phone is buzzing. It's my mom, she's texting me. I can't respond just yet because I need to make sure I have time to sustain an intentional, thoughtful conversation. When I do respond, I will reread my message over and over again to make sure it's written just right. After all, my parents could die at any moment and it's important that I say the right thing. One thing I can smell, something smells a little fishy. This reminds me of my grandmother's matcha jol or fish curry. Let me revisit that particular memory of walking into my childhood home 15 years ago and witnessing my grandmother's cooking, matcha jol. It's important that I remember every single detail of this moment. I can picture the color and the draping of my grandmother's sharis, who I am with, what we are saying, where everyone is standing, which doors are open in the kitchen, which doors are closed, what is on the kitchen counter, what the weather is like outside. It is important for me to remember everything about this moment. If I don't, I'm dishonoring my grandmother's memory. One thing I can taste, bittersweet, because while I can access so many of the details about a place, a space, and a time, what I can't access is how I felt in that place at that time. My experiences of sadness, trauma, and anxiety have been cataloged somewhere deep in me and I haven't figured out how to access, that I haven't figured out how to access yet, but I carry with me always, and so, instead, I tap, I count, I order, I check, I wash, and I place. A quiet and private tune, thrumming underneath the public persona of an organizer, a youth worker, and a community builder. At almost every moment, all cylinders firing, I'm waiting through these processes. It is my best kept secret, and it betrays me over and over again. This is what obsessive compulsive disorder is like for me, and it's exhausting. For a lot of people with OCD, it's not about being neat and organized. 
It's about being consumed with persistent, intrusive, distressing thoughts about your family dying. It's about taking hours to do one load of dishes because you have a need to constantly wash your hands due to some irrational fear of germs or contamination. It's about going to the store and feeling overcome with dread at the idea of buying two or four or six apples, so you have to buy five or three or seven. <laughs> It's needing to take the same exact route to work each morning because you know that if you don't, something terrible will happen. It's about arbitrarily repeating a specific movement over and over again until your body feels just right. It's about compartmentalizing and distracting yourself from the traumas, anxieties, and experiences, and instead internalizing and enacting them through a series of obsessions and compulsions that are often not visible or easily explainable to anybody, including yourself. It's a hundred little things every day that cognitively, intellectually, you understand don't make any sense, but you feel compelled to complete. It can take hours out of your day to manage. It's another job, except you're not getting paid. But for me, there are, are benefits. My OCD has made me hyper aware of everything around me and all of the ways that things are connected. And that has distinguished me as an organizer and as a youth worker. My OCD has made me deeply appreciative of my family and my friends. And that has served me as a community member and a community builder. And my OCD has helped embed in me a set of values that are somehow both dynamic and unwavering. And my OCD has brought me closer to my older brother. When I received my formal diagnosis a few years ago, I was really afraid to tell my family. We didn't grow up talking about mental health, and I was concerned that they might be dismissive or that they wouldn't want to talk about it at all. I had spent so many years trying to hide my symptoms from everybody in my life so that I could be the powerful, resilient, effective kid, friend, and community member I strive to be. But I was at a point when I recognized that I wouldn't be able to keep going if I couldn't figure out how to manage the symptoms. I wanted my family to know what was going on, and I wanted their support. One night, the summer before last, I invited my older brother over for dinner. I decided that I was going to tell him that night. I was really nervous. My older brother and I had a somewhat strained relationship throughout my early 20s, but he had recently moved to Chicago, and I was hoping to rebuild and move forward with him. That night, my partner cooked all of us dinner. It was sweltering hot both outside and inside my apartment, and we were in my dining room, sweating, eating, and drinking Caipirinhas. Uh, dangerous. And after a few drinks, I blurted out to my brother that I had received a diagnosis that I had that provided context for the things that I had struggled with my whole life, and that I wanted his support and the support of my family as I took steps to figure out how to manage this disorder so that I could fully live my life. To my surprise, my brother didn't say anything. Instead, he gently reached out and he touched my cheek, and then he said, what do you want to do right now? And I instinctively touched my other cheek. And then he told me that when he was in medical school, he learned about OCD and recognized from growing up with me that I had a number of the symptoms. And then he told me that he experienced distressing, intrusive thoughts until he was a teenager, which gave him some perspective into the magnitude of what I experienced on a daily basis. I'm sorry, he said, I had no idea how hard this was for you. And it's not your responsibility to defend or explain your diagnosis or your treatment to anyone in our family. If someone gives you a problem, just refer them to me. I got you, this doesn't have to be your fight. In that moment, I broke, because after so many years, I was finally being seen, and I was being held and supported, and it was beautiful. One thing I can see. I look at my birthday cake. It says, happy 30th birthday, V. 30 is supposed to be a bad luck year, because it's an even number, and even numbers are bad. But I look a little harder beyond the cake, and I see my brothers and my friends and my beautiful, loving community packed into a small bar in Rogers Park, showering me with so much love that I'm almost bursting. One thing I can touch, my wedding ring. I got married this year to an incredible person that I'm so excited to know and love. It's only on my left hand, but somehow I don't feel uneven. I don't need to touch my right hand to feel balanced out. It feels OK. One thing I can hear, Lena Joy, my older brother's new baby, offering a tiny pterodactyl screech of excitement. She is named after my grandmother. Through her, we honor my grandmother's memory. One thing I can smell. Something smells a little fishy. <laughs> this reminds me of lunchtime at the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago office, the place I worked for over eight years, an intensely fulfilling, life-affirming place that I left a few weeks ago because I realized that I was ready to take my next steps, and I know that I have a community behind me in so doing. One thing I can taste, bittersweet. I'm not sure that there will ever be freedom from this, but I can learn to manage it. 
And through this process of learning, I am growing to know myself better. Instead of internalizing and enacting experiences of trauma, sadness, and anxiety, through tapping, counting, ordering, checking, washing, and placing, I'm healing through these experiences. I'm allowing myself to understand more deeply about what happened, how it has affected me, and how I can move forward. And I am moving forward. I know 30 is supposed to be a bad year because it's an even number. Something tells me it's going to be OK. Oh, thank you so much. V, did you just have your birthday? A few months ago, I was going to sing a happy birthday song. <laughs> uh, uh, but happy birthday. Um, uh, oh, yes. Oh, tomorrow. <laughs> happy birthday. Uh, so, um, and, and, and I want to say this. Um, why are people afraid to tell personal stories? Because of shame. Because of stigma. Because of embarrassment. And why is it so important to tell stories? So we de-shame, so we destigmatize, so we give people the permission to tell stories. And this is what the second half is about. We carry the model minority image, but there's no heaven on earth. None of us live a heavenly life. And the second part is really look at the ugly side of our lives in our communities, and so we can figure out what to do with each other and for each other. Are you ready for our next storyteller? Yeah, Chloe Chen, Chloe, Chloe. Oh, very good. We met uh, at a round table Asian uh, storytelling, um, and for some reason that I know that she got a story to tell. Uh, she's a third culture kid that splits her childhood between um, an east, uh, northeastern uh, town or city in China and Chicago in the United States. And let's welcome Chloe. There's someone in the crowd I haven't seen in like 13 years. Shu, yeah? Hey, what's up? <laughs> Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, we're in high school together. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, so I learned a lot of my English by reading The Babysitter's Club. Um, if you don't know about The Babysitter's Club, it is a young adult series published in the 80s and 90s. And all of the stories are about this group of like really pretty popular girls um, from happy families and they babysit together. And they had these perfect dreamy lives. And I read book after book um, because their stories temporarily transported me away from the dread I felt almost all the time in my real life. So I was in Mrs. Martin's fifth grade class. And she taught us a history unit on Europe and World War II. You'll all read the diary of Anne Frank, she told us, as she passed out copies to each of us. I took a book from her and looked at Anne's picture on the cover. And it almost startled me. She was nothing like the picture-perfect babysitters. Her smile was crooked and her eyes tender. She was real, and she became a true friend to me. I was 12 the year I read Anne's diary. And two years before that, my grandparents picked me up early one day from school and pushed me gently into the back seat of a taxi. You're leaving now, they told me. It's happening today. The taxi took us to the Dalian train station where we boarded a sleeper train bound for Beijing. There we took one more car ride to the airport where I boarded a plane alone to fly 13 hours to start a new life in the US with my mom. Anne quietly disappeared from her life too. She went into hiding not long after her 13th birthday with her mom, dad, and her sister Margot into an annex not far from their Amsterdam home. It was a matter of life and death for the Jewish Frank family living under German occupation. In each our own ways, Anne and I both left our whole lives to escape violent patriarchs. Hers was Adolf Hitler. Mine was an abusive and deceptively charming father. Detroit was where I landed the first time I set foot in this country. When I got off the plane, I was grateful I still recognized her. My mom was there in a puffy red coat, and when she got up close, I remember thinking she had really long eyelashes. I'd been waiting for this for five years. 
In the boxy, fluorescently lit Detroit airport, I stood small and alone. She had brought someone with her, she told me. Jishni Baba, this is your new dad. Turned out that she had gotten married and hadn't told me. And we rode in silence for the five hour drive back to their home outside Chicago. I started school in the next week and it was hard being the new foreign girl. I had a bowl cut and uh, <laughs> didn't speak any English. Uh, but living with my mom turned out to be much, much harder. Maybe it was because I was my father's daughter and he hurt her, so she hurt me. At my orchestra concerts, I'd slowly scan the crowd from the stage, though I never found her there. I could count on her to be at least 30 minutes late to pick me up any time I stayed after school. I learned to lie to teachers, especially in the winter, so they didn't have to wait with me outside in the Chicago cold as I pined for her to come soon. One time, a teacher called home to say that the fleece I wore to recess in January wasn't enough, that I needed a real winter coat. My mom shrugged. But the yelling, the yelling was the worst part. She used to stand an inch from my locked door and scream in about how she wished I'd never been born, how I was a curse on her life, and how no one could ever love me, while my new dad sat quietly in the next room. And two years into this life, I found Anne. I was parched, and she was water. My nerves often get the better of me, she writes, about a year into hiding in the darkness. It is especially on Sundays that I feel rotten. The atmosphere is so oppressive and sleepy and as heavy as lead. You don't hear a single bird singing outside, and a deadly close silence hangs everywhere, catching hold of me as if it'll drag me down into an underworld. And at that, I knew she felt what I felt, dark, trapped, powerless. And part of me rejoiced at the recognition. As I sat on the inside of my childhood room over and over again, my mom unleashing her hatred outside as I rocked myself, crying hard, Anne's words began floating to the surface of my mind. Is my life worth living, I asked her. Yes, she said, just like mine. Am I more than what my mother says, and will I ever escape? Yes, she answered, and yes, she always had hope. Anne writes of herself, am I really so bad-mannered, conceited, headstrong, pushing, stupid, and lazy as they all say? Of course not. I have my faults, just like everyone else. And although I'm only 14, I know quite well what I want. I know who is right and who is wrong. So her voice sat inside me, next to my mom's, and gave me strength for just long enough. Anne died in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in northern Germany in March of 1945, less than a month before I was liberated by Allied forces. I got into a boarding school called IMSA in 2003, and it finally gave me the refuge I needed. Anne Frank is my hero for sure. She walked with me through dark times. But I also know now that I would have much rather had the story of a Chinese immigrant girl who lived through neglect and abuse and spoke to me from a place of healing, beckoning me forward, offering help. So that's why I'm telling this story, raw as it still is for me, and upset as all the members of my family would surely be knowing that I'm telling it to strangers. Our Asian American community is full of these types of stories, but we rarely hear them. We've been taught to label them as too shameful to tell, so we push them down deep under the illusion that this will protect. We've hidden our trauma for so long, the personal and the collective, and settled for sharing the most polite versions of ourselves. In the process, we've lost stories of perseverance, resilience, and triumph because we've conformed to the pressures urging us to keep our family trauma silent. So today, I've told you the most shameful parts of my family story. And it's okay, because I've already told it, lying in my best friend's bed and sitting on my therapist's couch, and I've come pretty far, although I know I'll be healing for the rest of my life. And maybe it'll somehow get back to my mom, what I've said here tonight, but I'm not afraid, because what I did today was tell the truth, and I hope you'll tell it too.
Oh, man. Thank you so much, Chloe. Uh, gosh, this is what storytelling is about. This is what this show is about. Um, I don't want the show to just entertain the audience. I want us to tell the truth. And I cry all the time, so take it. <laughs> this is a default mode. Um, so I, if, and I tell people that's because I, I used to be an academic, and now I'm normal, so I cry. <laughs> Um, but this is what this show is about. Talk about issues in our community. Um, what's wrong? What went wrong? What can we do better for one another? Thank you, Chloe. Can we get Chloe another round of applause? Uh, we come to our final storyteller. Um, and then we're going to have improv. Our final storyteller, Mia Park, multidisciplinary. Where is Mia? Oh, yes, a uh, multidisciplinary artist, and she's on TV, Empire Chicago uh, PD, Chicago Fire, um, also a yoga teacher, and most importantly, um, she produced this. Uh, this um, Platform. I mean, I think I should call it a platform, not just a show. I think it's more than that. Uh, our perspectives, Asian American plays, and I really have a lot of respect for Mia. This is what we're doing: create platforms so we can showcase uh, artists of Asian diaspora, Asian American descent. So let's welcome Mia Park. Thank you so much, Ada, right back at you. I'm gonna, this has been bothering me all night. I gotta fix the mic. Anyway, I just wanna say thank you to all the brave storytellers today. Some amazing stories. Oh my God, Chloe, you're like, I'm like, I can't cry yet because I have to talk. Thank you, it's amazing. Okay. So I just wanna say that this is actually my first time storytelling. I have been a professional actress for almost 20 years and I am on stage all the time and I've never actually done this before, so. What's that? Be nice! Just be authentic. You can be mean if you really, really want to be mean, as long as you're authentic. I do want to do kind of a trigger alert, though, that my story has some language that is, uh, could be offensive to gender and race, so just be warned. Okay, people? Oh, oh, wow, bow. Wow, bow, go home. Bitch, I said go home, wow, bow. Go home. So that was um, a young man that I'd never seen before who yelled that at me from across my condo lobby. I was standing in front of my door, and uh, he was in front of the building door. And I freaked out on him, and I said, who the fuck are you to call me wow bow in my own fucking home? Who the fuck are you? And then upstairs at that moment, I, we just started yelling, B, sir, gentlemen, bitch, go home. So in the building upstairs, there was one of my neighbors who I called affectionately drunky blonde daddy pays for everything. So she came stumbling down the stairs past me. And as she was coming down, I was so angry. And I yelled at her and I said, is this your fucking friend who's ching-chonging me in front of my house? And uh, yeah, I said that. And um, she stumbled past me, and she went up to the guy in the lobby, and she said, Michael, come on, we have to go. And then she just left him in the building yelling at me, and she went out and drew a ride chair. So by now, all my neighbors were out in the building, everybody who was home. And uh, one of my neighbors actually stepped up and tried to get him to leave, and he started calling, bitching her, bitch, bitch, everyone's a bitch. He's still yelling at me, bitch, go home. And he finally left, and I ran on the sidewalk. I was so frustrated and angry. I just yelled, um, this is not a college dorm. This is my home. So I have uh, worked really hard for 10 years at that point as a yoga teacher and as an actress, and only as a yoga teacher and an actress, to make enough money to buy my first condo. And I was so proud of myself. Uncompromised artist. I was like, I can, I'm all about authenticity. I can't work these dumb little part-time jobs anymore supporting my art. And I dove in and I did it. I bought my first condo. I loved the place. It was sunny. It was cute. It was a startup. Thank you. It was really great. Um, I got really involved. I uh, cleaned the place up. I got everyone to come to the board meetings or the, the HOA meetings because not everybody did. And I met, you know, all of my neighbors. This is a small building. Um, it was all 
perky, white millennials, most of them women. They seemed liberal. I mean, they had like tattoos and purple hair and like had rainbow flags in their window. And, you know, they like one was a librarian and I thought one voted for Bernie. And I was like, I think these people are not only going to raise my property value, <laughs> but somehow I'm going to feel safe in this building even though I never felt completely welcome because I was by far the oldest person in the building and the only person of color. But I thought somehow I could fit in because like I'm cool and I have tattoos and I'm an artist, but I wasn't white and I wasn't a millennial. And even that demographic that I felt somehow safe in or wanted to feel safe in has its limits when pushed. So after, um, so two years ago on that night, right, um, I'm sorry, I'm checking my notes here. Yeah, going back to that night, I uh, was home alone, and my white boyfriend, who was a lawyer, had just left, and I was just home, and I heard someone out right side of my door yell, get the fuck out here! And it's very much my personality to open the door and stand out there. This was after hours of me hearing um, drunky, blonde, daddy buys for everything, partying and yelling upstairs. And so I knew this was one of her friends. And I, he sounded like a gay, young black man. And I opened the door and there was who I assumed to be a gay, young black man. He was yelling up the stairs at um, drunky, blonde, daddy buys everything. And I stood right there and I looked at him and I said, I am the fuck out here. Why are you yelling in my house? And that's when he turned around and saw me and started backing down the stairs. Wow, bow. Wow, bow. Which, if you don't know, of course, here in Chicago is a chain of Chinese fast food restaurants with the little bow, the buns. He was whacking down the stairs, and that's how that started. So uh, the month after that, I, I took everything. I called, you know, I called my boyfriend, and who was actually not that helpful at the time. Um, we're not dating anymore. But uh, actually what happened was after they left and all my neighbors came out who were home, um, these people who I thought were my allies and had already proven through different interactions in the building not to be allies and I decided just to live with them. I put so much expectation in these like white liberal millennials, you know, women, women. I thought we could be allies if not friends. They just stood there and stared at me. And I freaked out. I yelled and I said, I can't believe these fucking being racially ass in my home, this slip rug, my, my home, I'm so upset. And then I felt guilty and embarrassed and I apologized to them for, for yelling. And then they all walked away without saying a word and they vanished into their units. I went into my condo, slammed the door and it burst down the tears, called my boyfriend. He said, I don't, I'm sorry, babe, what happened? I just slipped there, call the police. So then I, my, uh, one of my upstairs neighbors who saw the whole thing, she actually emailed me and apologized and said, I am so sorry we just left you there. I don't think we didn't know what to do. Um, I'm sorry that happened, which was a bone, I guess. So the month later at the um, Homeowners Association, I was so upset at I said, this is, this is what I want. I want him permanently banned from the building. I want there to be an anti-harassment rule in the rules, the condo rules, and I want her fined. I want drunky blondie daddy pays for everything fined for allowing this harassment to happen in the building. But then the board, who were two of these millennial liberal non-allies, and drunky blondie daddy plays for everything's dad, who was on the board that didn't recluse himself from the board, which he should have, none of them believed me. They said that nobody actually heard him call me wow bow. And so um, they didn't believe me. And in fact, the dad uh, yelled at me I recorded the whole meeting, audio-wise. But uh, I don't want to listen to it again because I don't need to. I just needed to feel like I would be heard or seen somehow. He yelled at me. He kept cutting me off. He said, you don't have a police report, do you? And it's funny because my lawyer ex-boyfriend at the time said, go to the police. And I didn't want to do that. And I said, no. Well, how could you have been racially harassed? If you're harassed, I mean, that's against law, right? You don't have a police report. Where's your, where's your police report, Mia? Do you have it? And I said, I don't have a police report. I can't believe you're sitting here um, telling me that this didn't happen because it happened. Did it? So we left. Um, I went to the police station a couple days later, got a police report. I scanned that. I emailed it to the whole building. And I said, here's your fucking police report. And the result was that nothing actually happened um, 
the police report did nothing. They came to the same kind of conclusion. They banned Michael from the building for six months. Um, they still didn't believe or acknowledge that it happened. And they did put in an anti-harassment rule in the rules, which is good, but the penalty was like uh, $8 a day until you apologized, which is nothing. And isn't that indicative of how kind of white liberals try to solve problems? We're going to do this, but it's really not going to be a penalty. So I managed to live in that building for another uh, 14 months, and I feel so much better that I left. So that is a part of the story. Um, another part of the story that I need to, that I've come full circle with and embrace is that I, I, I recognize fully now that I'm partially responsible for what happened. When Michael was outside of my door yelling, telling me to get the fuck out, I didn't have to open the door, but I did. And when he was standing there, I didn't have to yell at him, but I did. And I certainly didn't have to curse at him, but I did. So I'll accept whatever energy I put into that. But I went on to tell the story a lot to a lot of people. And, you know, two years later, I have to take responsibility for the fact that, um, this is very embarrassing, I exaggerated the level of my harassment when I explained this story. Because uh, I was just, even this is even before the condo board didn't believe me. Um, in my desperation to be seen and heard, I overplayed that race card. And what I, the story I told people was that Michael took one hand and made like a slant eye while he was calling me wow bow. Now, during him yelling at me, he was drunk and his hands were certainly kind of going in places. I mean, he was a lot like, oh, wow bow. I never saw him do that. I never saw him put his finger to his eye and make like a slant eye. But that's the story I told people. Um, when he said go home, he may have been actually telling me to go home because I was in front of my condo door. But the way I tell the story is that he made a slant eye, called me wow bow, and told me to go home, meaning wherever he thought I was from. So I went on to realize that when I told that story to even my friends of color who weren't Asian, that's the version they got. But when I called my sister and when I told my Asian friends, I just told them what happened. And what I told you is what I remember exactly as it happened. So I realized that I, even to other people of color, I needed to be, feel like I was that racially harassed in order to be believed. And in the end, it didn't matter. Because the people in power at the time, who happened to be young white millennials and like the dad, didn't believe me anyway, no matter what I said. So now I can come full circle and embrace that it happened and just say that me just telling the story as it is, is enough. And I can admit that I exaggerated how harassed I was because I realize now that I am enough. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mia. Thank you so much. Give another round of applause for Mia. So, we are about to hit the entertainment portion of the night, and uh, before we begin, I just want to do a little quick breathing exercise, so everyone, inhale, exhale, again, inhale, exhale, y'all feel better, a little bit, all right, so, the uh, next entertainment portion is, um, I would like to introduce Stir Friday Night. They are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit theater organization that works to build Asian American theater, comedy theater, uh, throughout Chicago. They travel to places in the US. Um, if you're interested in doing comedy, or take a stab at it, meet them afterwards, because we're always in need for more Asian Pacific Islander folks to uh, make us laugh. and. So are you ready to LOL, SMH? <laughs> All right, I take it as a yes. So give it up for Stir Friday Night. Hello everyone, uh, we are Stir Friday Night. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Stir Friday Night is 
Night is a 25-year-old comedy institution uh, founded here in the city of Chicago. It was founded by so many wonderful Asian American performers who were seeing each other at auditions and uh, realized that it would be way cooler if they started making some shows happen for themselves. And we've had so many wonderful alumni, I think up to 100, over in Sooner Friday Night over the years, and they are now all across America making their wonderful art. Uh, so we'll be doing some improv for you tonight. Uh, we're all processing what were some pretty amazing but heavy stories. Uh, so we'll just be taking some light inspiration from what we've heard tonight and also bringing in our own experiences and that'll inform the scenes that we do for you all. Uh, thank you so much. And to get started, can I get a suggestion of uh, anything at all? <laughs> <laughs> Cilantro. 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 <laughs> <laughs> What'd you taste? Oh, uh, sorry, Mom. Um, remember I had the jeans? Cilantro tastes like soap to me. <sighs> well, I want you to taste my laundry detergent. Tastes clean enough. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, tastes like cilantro. Okay, good. <laughs> Can I borrow the car? Why? To go to church. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know you wouldn't lie to me, so. No, no, just of not. going to see God. <laughs> I mean, God is everywhere. Uh, yeah, but he's specifically not here right now. <laughs> Did someone say God? <laughs> I was gonna see you in the car. Yes, but I can see you right now. I love your long eyelashes. Just can I say that? <laughs> Thanks, God. Oh, uh, laundry detergent? Yeah. I brought some of my own. Every laundry detergent is different, so why don't you taste this one? Oh. I would love to. <laughs> Still tastes like cilantro. Yeah. <laughs> mm, I'm tasting a little bleach. <laughs> yes, a lot of bleach. <laughs> I'm like, why? Yes. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Oh, I feel sick. Well, you messed up again, God. They're very sick. Yeah. <laughs> I keep helping the people and giving them my, my laundry detergent. It tastes so delicious. No, it doesn't. <laughs> That's a you thing, that's not an us thing. <laughs> These humans, they have to try it. It's absolutely delicious. It cleans their clothes. Yes, everyone is different, but this is my own recipe. <laughs> Listen, everyone is different, and everyone is beautiful. But they are all united in one thing. Bleach will murder them. <laughs> Oh, cool. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you so much. Um, Would you like a sample? Yes. Go. Um, do you sing now or later? Cold stone, <laughs> la la la, ice cream. Oh, you have to tip first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, but also, I'm saving my voice for an audition. So. <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> so, I would like the tip, but I would prefer if you didn't make me sing. Do okay, no, sing? no, I have so many questions. So, uh, my daughter just took up acting. Oh, fun for her. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say fun. I mean, she cries a room, lot in her room and, uh... In there, yes. Relatable. Um, yeah, so, uh, I, I was hoping, you know, you could tell me a little bit more about the... the acting. <laughs> really inspired me and helped me through all the tough times and people would be shitty to me and not leave tips and all that. Wow, I brought my own pen. Yeah. <laughs> wow, oh, it's so good. It, it sometimes gets better. Honey, 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 uh, that movie was a big hit. We're very happy for you, but have you considered going back to school? <laughs> Get an MBA. <laughs> Dorm. 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, was it the degree that let you let me in? <laughs> uh, yes, I could recognize it on your face. <laughs> you look like a learned person. <laughs> I'll be honest, it's mostly the glasses. I can tell that you've read a lot and ruined your eyes. <laughs> so for me, how's the real estate going? Oh, it's going great. Uh, Better than the acting. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to put quotes around it. <laughs> Saying is it better than acting. <laughs> I was on Chicago Med, Mom. That's something. Okay, well, now you can't work for two more years on it, so. <laughs> and that's why I'm in real estate. <laughs> oh, God, I'm having a heart attack. Is anyone a doctor or that's played a doctor on TV? <laughs> I, I played patient, so I can sympathize. <laughs> So, uh, why'd you want to buy a weed in a church? That's pretty good. Uh, listen, can I be real with you? Yeah, sure. Alright, I'm 16, my mom thinks I'm at church, um, and I, I just, I want to go to prom, so, what do you want, okay? <laughs> okay, uh, well, I don't know, I'd like a corsage, I guess. Okay, okay, so we got carnations, I also got daisies, and this is a dandelion I picked up on the street. <laughs> Honestly, my girlfriend's very into botany, so a medley of all three. <laughs> and hey, use your art, you know? Like, make it whatever you like. I'm not gonna judge. Really? Yeah, no, that'd okay. be super rude to buy a corsage and I'm picking it apart, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't do that. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put it on you. The pin is free. Thank you. <laughs> um, that'll be $120. Can you Venmo? Yeah, sure. Sure, I can. Um, but also, my turn now. So we got Molly, we got Ecstasy. <laughs> Panda Express, go home. Panda Express, go home. What's wrong, Ethnicity? No, Panda Express, go home. You're gonna call me out. Subway sandwich. Here, Subway sandwich. Panda Express, go home. You go home, sandwich. You get out of here. Me? You're both yelling at me? Panda Express, go home. Did you check the box for Panda Express, or did you check the box for Subway Sandwich? Neither of them! <laughs> Come to McDonald's. We're post-racial. <laughs> <laughs> it's allowed at McDonald's. Literally anything. <laughs> and how uh, dare you all. Yeah. Excuse me, uh, Popeyes has entered the conversation. Mm. We're all about race. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have a new chicken sandwich that's mainly made from noodles. Anyways, <laughs> I'm the original of the chicken sandwiches. Anyway, I guess I'm gonna have to go Popeyes. Wait. Okay. Well, Thank remember you. us. Yeah. Why? <laughs> My daddy owns all of you, so. <laughs> Son, um, you want to know? I brought you both here uh, to this graveyard to get over your fear of math. Um, if someone was born in 1950 and they died in 1950, what does that mean, math wise? Why does it say, gone too soon? Well, that should help you arrive at the right answer. <laughs> 16 when they died. <laughs> what? <laughs> 16? What was the question? Sorry, I'm just. It was. Well, maybe it'll help if I read the name. Alberta Albertson. Now, what the century? Greater Albertson? Yeah, the Albertson. What, the rich can die young? Is that fair? They sure can. <laughs> I didn't mean for you guys to get more fears in this cemetery. Yeah, I just did bad, I did bad on my SAT, so I mean, bringing me to the graveyard, that's, I'm learning, so. <laughs> there, right. there are 72 bodies here, that's what you want. Well, that is math, so I'm sorry. <laughs>
uh, music, dance, uh, improv, and most importantly, our stories examine homeland politics, our oppression, our bias, our prejudice, everything about us. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, let me kind of. <laughs> <laughs> to cultivate and develop new and emerging tellers. This is so important for us to preserve history. This is not just a show. Let's make this an oral history in action. Everyone has a story to tell. Good night, sweet dream.